only one thing to do tonight. It is to take you to Nigeria, where we are now anticipating the Nigerian verdict. Implications for the sub-region is a specific thing that we'll be exploring on PM Express tonight. We all have been following very keenly what is happening in Nigeria, our big brother, of course. And tonight, we will be trying to tell you where we are with the latest results, but most importantly, what the outcome in Nigeria will mean for all of us in the sub-region. And of course, it means a lot. It is the most populous country, economically heavyweight, and a key aspect of the elections also signals what the world perceives about the sub-region generally. And that's why there's a lot of focus on Nigeria, and rightly so. And so let's get into that particular conversation. These are the three main individuals who are, are seen as the key front runners in the Nigerian polls. And there is Bola Tudubu, he is the all progressive Congress APC candidate and they represent the incumbent uh, political party in question and he's leading them, Peter Obi. I'll come to Peter Obi last because of, he has really brought a lot of buzz about the Nigerian elections. And then you have Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party that's the main opposition party, the PDP. And of course, Peter Obi, you may have heard of him. He's the man who is representing this uh, less known party called the Labour Party that has thrown a particular wedge among these two main political parties and has become officially a third force in Nigerian politics. And a lot of Ghanaians have been watching the Nigerian elections. There's more interest now than before because of his emergence and many are saying, for example, that if Obi and the Labour Party can do it and, and, and challenge these two individuals and these two main political behemoths, then definitely somebody could also emerge from Ghana and challenge the MPP and the NDC. And that is one of the key implications that we are all observing to see if it will, what happens in Nigeria will, will start to spark in Ghana for next year's elections. And Obi is 61 years old. Both of, of these are above 70 years. And he's pitching himself as a youthful candidate and the youth loving. Those who follow him, they call themselves the obedience. But the obedience, and you know what they do there? Obi. And then they add the dance to it because they are very loyal to his cause. And they are very active young group of voters, most of them recently registered voters who operate and have used and deployed the tools of social media very aggressively. He also benefits from the so-called coconut head generation in Nigeria. And coconut head because they believe these young groups of people and they proudly call themselves coconut head generation because they, they believe they, they, they don't really fear they are fearless, peerless, and they simply stand against the establishment and want to challenge the status quo and shake up the system. Th that same group was behind the NSAS, the NSAS protest that brought change in Nigeria because many people in Nigeria said it was impossible for pure protest to bring change. They brought change and they're backing him. And that is why tonight you see that he swept across Lagos, a state that APC always wins, he's won it. And that is a very important win indeed. And as the votes come in, we're beginning to learn a bit more. And that, 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 as I said, is the man who is representing the current political uh, incumbent party in power. His age tells you all you need to know about, about him, the uh, Mr. Tirubu, who, by the way, is doing well and he's in the lead. But I need to caution you, you know, this is just a tiny fraction of the results in, and it comes from uh, Tinibu strongholds generally, the results that are coming so far. So pay attention to that and put in the context of, of where the results have come from. And so we'll see that. So that's him. He's been a governor before, co-founder of the All Progressive Congress, uh, government, governor of Lagos, and he's credited uh, for improving the financial system in Lagos, for example, and it's also very, very rich. And of course, the main political party, a former vice president, national vice chair of the People's Front of Nigeria, uh, a fifth presidential election. He's been running and running and running, and he believed this is his term 
to win. And so those are the many years that he stride. And Obi, I just told you the story about him. He's the one shaking up the system in, in Nigeria. And he is, 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 is known as a very frugal person. And I like this about his campaign. Rarely in Africa would you find a candidate who coins a campaign message around the slogan, I don't give shishi. Or put it differently, we don't give shishi. In Nigeria, which means we don't give money. And he's been saying this very boldly on the campaign platforms, right? Can you imagine a candidate who boldly coins a campaign slogan out of I don't give money? I mean, so that is one of the things that his followers point to and say, among these two individuals, when it comes to the issue of corruption and money, he is the cleanest of the Lord. Doesn't mean that he is impeccable or he's a saint because we've seen that uh, his name cropped up in the Pandora Papers when issues surrounding you know, African politicians stashing money in foreign accounts, his name was popped up there. Accusations about giving contracts, for example, when he was a governor, by the way, to a company that had links to him. But if you compare him to the rest of the field and his frugality when it comes to that, then he stands tall. A man who says he wouldn't buy a car for his 30-year-old son. And in Nigeria, for a politician with that wealth, they flaunt it, and they flaunt it on your kids and kin and your relatives and children, but he says, I won't do so. One of his children is a teacher, and many say, well, that is the man we need for a country like Nigeria. We'll come to talk a bit more about him. And so what do we know about the key issues that the ECOWAS Observer Mission have told us since the poll started uh, on Saturday? A few things. Late start, which is very normal in Africa, right? Cases of delivery of wrong materials, respondents of elections and polling units, unavailability of sufficient quantities of electoral material. So these are things that if you're in Ghana, you're very, very used to. It happens uh, quite a lot. And then, of course, they use the BVAS, uh, a BVD equivalent uh, in Nigeria as well, cases of you know, ballot snatching. I must say, though, that's where Ghana stands a bit tall because that has, that has rarely been eliminated from our elections. Ballot snatching has rarely, has, has virtually been eliminated. But we're seeing that in Nigeria. We've seen videos of ballot not only being snatched, but the ballot paper is destroyed and bent in the process, right? We, we've, 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 that has all, all, almost gone. But there's been violence there, and ECOWAS has picked up on a number of those as well. The electoral process with uh, Boko Haram, it, this is all happening in the midst of insecurity, and Boko Haram has cited, in, in some cases, terrorizing some communities and making it very difficult for people to go out and vote. And often, this then affects the voter uh, turnout. We'll, we'll talk about that. And if you look at the uh, S SBM intelligence, they tell you a story about 93 million registered voters. That's a huge number of people registered to vote. But just a few will actually turn out to vote. We'll tell you about that story. But this is one of those things that many watch, and I'm talking about the age factor in the number of people who have registered to vote. Because if you look at the um, youth 18 to 34, right, that bracket of, of young people, that's what you see here, 37 million. And that's a very huge part of this pie here that they occupy, 18 to 34. The argument is these are uh, the men and women who call themselves the obedient. Majority of them, obedient. They are in the, in, the, in the camp of Peter Obi or the coconut head generation, right? They are those in this particular bracket and they may support Peter Obi. And then, it, again, it follows here because you have the middle age, 35 to 49. Again, same bracket of people who are most likely, more likely to support Obi than the 70 plus candidates. And so many look at this and say, maybe this will play to his advantage. We'll see, but there are no absolutes in politics. If you follow the social media mobilization, you say this is the case, but can you translate your online presence and mobilization to actually boots on the ground, votes? That is the most important thing. And then you, of course, you go to the elderly who fall in this bracket here, quite a small number. So this is a very, uh, young population of voters, that, that story they're beginning to pan out very clearly. And then you have the groups, and again, students. 
again from SBN Intelligence. Students form the bulk majority of the registered voters here, 26 million. Again, many say that will influence the outcome in, 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 uh, in favour of Obi. But don't let this fool you because Obi, one of, one of the challenges that he's facing is that he's, his campaign is non-national in character. He's a Christian and so his base is in the south and he, he will struggle to get votes from the predominantly Muslim north. But there's been reports that even when he's campaigning in the north, he still had huge uh, numbers at rallies. But don't make anything out of rallies. Because in Africa, you can rent a rally, right? You can rent the numbers who go. So that's one of the challenges that he will face. And that's an advantage that both Atiku Abu Bakr and Tinubu will have over him when it comes to that particular part of the equation. But then some would say, if you flip the coin, though, we have a, a Muslim in power and maybe you know, Nigerians are fed up with, with that particular aspect of things and we'll vote for it. But another thing I want to talk about with the age and I find it interesting is that if you look at the current, you know, the latest results, and I will come to that, you'll, you'll begin to see that Tinubu APC is leading, although he's old, right? I, I find that interesting. I'll tell you why very shortly. But this is what I was talking about when it comes to the voter turnout. The last elections, they had 34% Let's say 35%, right? 34% voter turnout for a country or with the voter population almost of 100 million people, right? I mean, it was a bit less than that in the last elections. To have 34% voter turnout, that is alarming. But there's no surprise that you have a steady decline in terms of the voter turnout. I guess that as the insecurity situation the insurgency, militant attacks and terrorism in, in parts of Nigeria has become more pronounced over the years. It's also contributed to the increase in low voter turnout. That's my hypothesis. But thankfully, I'll be joined by people who understand this better than I am. And so maybe they can give us a sense of why we have very low voter turnout. And so the former finance minister of Nigeria uh, Kozi Wela was, you know, voting and, and she, she expressed optimism that this year there might be an increase in voter turnout. But one of the key things that the ECOWAS Observer Mission have observed that the places they've been, voter turnout has been very low. We don't know whether that will reflect in the final turnout across the country. And there's a projection that will be my win. And listen, this you can, you can take with a pinch of salt because politics, it's, it's one of those things that in Nigeria it's not like Ghana where if it was Ghana and this was uh, two days after the elections, I'd probably be standing here ready to you know, call the elections for you. Nigeria, they don't have that system because the laws make it impossible for that to happen. You have to rely on INEC, INEC elections and results only. My guests are joining me, but I am interested in everything I've said about the implications for the sub-region. And by the way, I want to show you what we're seeing on BBC. And this, by the way, is the uh, latest results on the BBC website taken from the INEC, the Nigerian equivalent of the Electoral Commission. And you see here, if, if you may, the first one is the Bola Tinubu, who is leading with 44% of the votes, followed by Atiko Ubakar with 33% of the votes, and Peter Obi with 16% of the votes. The INEC will give us more results tomorrow. So that is how it stands now. I'll get my guests who are live in Nigeria to give me the very latest whether this is, has changed since BBC last updated its, uh, its live blog as far as the results are concerned. And so that is a story there. Obi in third, Tinibu in second, Bola, uh, uh, Atiku in second, and Bola in, in, in first there as far as this is concerned. But I, I'm, uh, you, you, you follow this result and I put the caveat the majority of the results that have come in have come in from Bola Tinubu stronghold. And so that may be why this is. So we are really way away from the final results. After the break, my guests will join me and then we'll get into the specifics of this. But we'll stress what the outcome could possibly mean for sub region, for Ghana, and maybe some of the parallels we begin to draw for a country like ours. Because we also go into the post next year. Stay with me.
Dr. Chuku Emeka is the executive director of the West African Network for Peace Building, and he's uh, joining me. He himself is a Nigerian and a, a staunch supporter of uh, a certain team that I, I mean, I recently. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he tried to co-opt me to supporting Arsenal and, you know, I mean, he sent me a nice jersey. And so, yes, I have become an, an associate supporter of, uh, of, of Arsenal. And I know he wished me a congratulations after we won, we won that cup yesterday. Um, Chukwe Mekas, thank you very much for joining us here on PM Express. Indeed. Uh, also joining thank us uh, tonight is uh, Kayla Megwa. And Kayla is a journalist, Channels TV Nigeria. And I'll come to her first to help us with the latest. Ike Afion is a head of research at the SBM Intelligence. Hello, Ike. Thank you very much for connecting with us here on, uh, on PM Express. Um, we'll be joined by another of our own who is also in Nigeria uh, tonight, helping with the monitoring. And uh, tonight he's with the Democratic Union of Africa. Peter McManey, a former chairman of the Governor New Patriotic Party here. Koku Aindu, who is a member of the ECOWAS Observer Mission, and he joins us on the phone. I would have to deal with him and Kayla very quickly so you know they can go and I'm sure they had a very hectic day. Um, Kayla, let me start with you. I mean, uh, and uh, thank you for agreeing to talk to us. And I imagine that this would have been a pretty hectic period for you. But let's start with the very latest with the results. Um, I was bringing up uh, what BBC had said about the results tonight. But if you can update us, if you may, on what the INEC official results say about at least the three front runners. Yes, okay, so uh, the coalition has, uh, well, it's been adjourned, at least uh, that's the update I have. The coalition for the presidential election uh, results has been adjourned till tomorrow. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of results coming in from all of the states. So that's something that, we were, that we're uh, seeing right now. One of the major issues that has been on the forefront of conversations today has been on the Beavers machine and the uploading of results from the Beavers machine to the IREC, to the INET, to the INEC portal. And that, that has, uh, today we saw people stage a walkout. We saw 10, 10 uh, party, party faithful, uh, faithful from different parties, a stage a walkout today at the International Conference Center as a result of this, calling for a stoppage of the um, announcements of the results until this whole uh, BIVA situation is sorted out and they wanted explanations as to why the portal had issues, even though there were assurances given that it wasn't going to uh, give any problems uh, for the elections. That's for the national elections. We've seen results from, from so many states coming in. Uh, I'm covering the FCT in particular. In fact, right now, I'm just, I'm actually parked in front of the INEC uh, office for the federal capital territory right here uh, in Abuja. And, you know, we're trying to see the results from the elections in Abuja itself. That's what we're trying to get together. Uh, I've been trying to explain to you, we have six area councils in Abuja. We've seen the results for the presidential election. We've seen the results for five of those area councils. One of the area councils has not been, hasn't, the result from that council has not been given yet. And that particular place is AMAC, the Abuja Municipal Area Council. So we're actually waiting on that. That's why we're still here. We're thinking that maybe it was going to be sorted out sometime during the night. Uh, however, we were just told right now that that would not be possible. We have to come back here tomorrow at 8 a.m. And hopefully the results from the Abuja Municipal Area Council are given. And then we can be able to announce who actually, you know, had, uh, who, who won in the nation's capital, which is very crucial. A uh, uh, lot of drama has been going on around the elections that happened in Abuja itself. Um, and then we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of that trying to get resolved. Uh, we had a situation in one of the places in Abuja called Guarimpa, where uh, the coalition officers were actually attacked. We actually saw that happen. The thugs had attacked the place. In fact, the EU missions released a statement about that today as well, decrying that particular situation. So we have that going on. On a national level, uh, we have results coming in from states like Ekiti. Uh, Nasrawa State was the last state to, uh, re to bring in some results before they decided to adjourn. So it's a process that is ongoing, and we're watching to see how it all unfolds. Hopefully, we get done with this situation, <laughs> done with this presidential election in the next week or so, it, within the week, rather, so we can move on to preparing for the governorship elections, which will be coming up in March. Okay, uh, and Ike, I want to bring you in. Ike, you've been working the numbers 
at, um, at the organization. Um, walk me through what you see in terms of the trends that you are re observing with the results tonight. The, as of the last check with the INEC, uh, Bola Tinibu was still in the lead, followed by Atiko Bubaka and Peter Robi. And But as um, others have noted, with the results that we've seen so far mainly come from Tinibu's stronghold. I, is that what the situation is? And can I confirm that? Uh, good evening, and thanks for having me. Um, yeah, very much so, right? Um, you're seeing uh, those results, uh, you know, sort of trickle in. And uh, I think most of the Southwest uh, geopolitical zone, Nigeria has six of them. Uh, most of the Southwest geopolitical zone has reported results right now. Um, that is the core of, uh, um, of Tinubu's um, core support. Um, and he has largely uh, uh, carried that region. Um, uh, albeit, you know, uh, Peter Obi of the Labour Party uh, flipped, um, 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 flipped Lagos in what is a major upset. And um, I believe Atiku Abubaka won um, Ocean State, right? Um, you know, which, uh, um, you know, which was won by the PDP in a state governorship race, right? Uh, just last year, but uh, those results are being challenged in the courts right now. Um, I, I, having said that, there are sort of two layers of um, of election results for the president, presidential elections that are being called, and that's you know sort of a unique feature of Nigeria's electoral system. Um, so there's a national coalition center in Abuja where Kela is right now, and you know sort of where um, all of the main results which have been transmitted and certified um, in Abuja are being called, and that was sort of the basis. Um, of the election results breakdown that you you showed up earlier on, on 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 you know on, on that graphic from from the BBC, but the states also after they've done you know collation from all the wards and all the polling units within their jurisdiction, um, are also required to call the elections before actually um, taking those results to um, Abuja to be transmitted. And there are some states that have already called um, some of their results for the presidential election. And that haven't yet transmitted those um, formally to uh, the National Co and Coalition Center in Abuja. And, and we are seeing some interesting trends, right? So, for example, I think one states that literally just as you were going um, on air at the start of this program, right, to just declare these results was being wasted in central Nigeria, in the north central geopolitical zone. It appears as though uh, Bola Tinubu has won that in what. I mean, there were many observers that weren't expecting that. When I, we ourselves at SBM Intelligence um, weren't suspecting that uh, uh, Tinubu was going to win uh, being with state. Um, as aware, were, there are a couple of other states to, um, I believe, um, uh, Nasarawa and Kaur at the federal level. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a particular state that's of Aquaibum. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and I should know that because that's actually my home state. Right, um, you know the uh, the PDP candidate at the actually carried that, also seen as a bit of a surprise, considering that uh, many consider the South South geopolitical zone what many many people in other parts of Africa and around the world would not Niger Delta, right? And um, you know that that's seen by many as sort of you know one of those core geographic hubs of support for Peter B. Uh, but in past election cycles, it's generally voted. Uh, for the People's Democratic Party, and it's, it seems as though the PDP has at, at least protected right one of those states. Okay. So there's that slow trickle of results that's sort of just um, filtering and coming through right now, and we'll sort of have a clearer sense of where we yeah, stand uh, and, 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 and who's really... And, and talking about the results, I'll come back to Kayla for, quickly, and I know Kayla has to go back in, but Kayla, please stay with me briefly, because I just want to understand uh, today it was a big event, and you talked about that, where... Um, the INEC chair was announcing the results and some of the parties boycotted it. But let me come to Chuku and Maker. Chuku, you've been watching this very closely. I wonder whether you, you, you went to Nigeria to vote yourself. But with your background and watching what has been unfolding in Nigeria, your own uh, home country, I, I wonder what your take is on, on the conduct of the, of the poll so far, especially at this time when we, Kayla has just been reporting that parties are boycotting the polls. Is there a real concern or do you have any of post-election disturbances? So, sorry, please unmute for me, uh, Chuku. Please unmute for me. 
Yeah, I was saying that if you follow the President of Bassanjo's uh, press um, conference this evening, you will really be disturbed about uh, the way things are going. I think in, in our own opinion, I, I think that this is a missed opportunity for the Independent National Electoral Commission to have uh, gained mileage with regards to the kind of um, confidence uh, crisis he has enjoyed, as it were, over the, over the years. I think that in the build-up to this election, a lot of people had a, a strong confidence in the ability of INEC, especially following the, the kind of uh, interest he generated following the, the review of the electoral laws and um, the electoral acts, which literally, in my opinion, gave them everything that it required to make this election free and fair. However, uh, without already saying that there is element of fraud, I think that what has happened is the inability of even INEC to communicate at very risky times. So the communication risk management uh, system within INEC has been has been faulted to the extent that INEC we are always coming from behind, you know. So they left a lot of vacuum, and people are now filling in those gaps, including some of the agents of the political party. So I give you two examples. The first thing that happened is that INEC provided the process to this election, and its results we are going to be uploaded to its own portal which made it almost proof, tight proof for any kind of rigging to take place. Now, you are unable to upload those results from the polling stations. And you had no announcement whatsoever regarding that. People had to remind you before you now played catch up, as it were. So that has, and this is a, a crucial election, based on those statistics you, you brought out. This is the first time in many years that Nigerians we are ready to go to the pool. If you look at the trajectory over a period of time since our um, recent republic following the military regime, you have never seen this kind of enthusiasm. Probably in 1999 you saw it, but not exactly like this. You know, so INEC should have un understood that this is a very critical and even an existential election that needed them to be up to the game. And indeed, Nigerians, including the National Assembly, were ready to enact the platform to make this election free and fair. So without considering whether there has been an element of fraud or not, INEC has left a lot of vacuum that have put tremendous question on their credibility, including the chair of the uh, Independent National Electoral Commission. I am convinced, beyond all reasonable doubt, that most of the political parties are already aware where this election is going to, but they have now been provided the atmosphere to challenge the credibility of INEC and this ability to deliver on this electoral process. So every well-meaning Nigerian, every well-meaning member of the ECOWAS community have a right to be concerned about where this is going to. And especially if you now begin to hear the utterances, including some of the emerging post-election activities that is already taking place in some opposition strongholds. This is a cause for, for concern. For concern. And Kayla, let me ask you uh, briefly before you, you take leave of us. So because of the concerns that uh, Chukwe Maker had just identified, and you also touched on the fact that at the collation center, um, some of the parties boycotted and left and held a, a separate press conference. What's been the reaction in Nigeria to that? Um, that sort of boycott and the very public disagreement that we saw play out on, on national television to this. Are people reacting to this on the streets? So it's a walkout, yeah? So what they did was stage an actual walkout uh, at, at, the, at the National Pollution Center. Chukwemeka is actually speaking to, to the heart of the matter, really, because... You, whether, you, whether there's any admission of fraud or anything, we can't, we can't say anything about that. But what has happened is that this vacuum has been created. It's not even a, a question of, of political preferences or, you know, what party you stand on or what you support. This system, this Beaver system was the game changer. This was the game changer. This was what 
we all, a lot of young people believed in this process because this paper carrying was going to end. We were not going to be having situations where the professor would sit down and start to call numbers and then you get tired. The idea that it was going to, going to be done electronically in such a way that there is actually no way you can read this. We saw you transmit the results. We saw what was there. We took a picture of it. The fact that that particular critical element failed has in many ways destroyed the trust that many Nigerians had in this process. That is the truth. And for, for, for a generation of, of voters, 13, over 13 million new voters, 70% of which were young Nigerians. We had spent so many years worrying about the fact that young Nigerians are only interested in watching Big Brother and gossiping and talking about personalities online. They decided to get into the process. This particular scenario, whether INEC wants to admit it or not, in fact, to, 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 to explain INEC's point of view, they did apologize, but like Chupemeka said, that apology came after they were reminded. They didn't speak from the front. If, if the problem was going to come from them and they could see that there was a problem and they addressed that problem, it would have made a lot of people angry as well, but it would have been able to make people feel like these people understand that we are watching them. It almost feels in many ways, at least from the people that I've spoken to at, because of course party faithful are here at the, at the FCT INEC office. You can, you can feel the anger in them. Why did you lie to us? It's like the feeling that you're getting from people. Why didn't you tell us that this could happen? You promised that this was not going to happen and we believed you. I actually spoke to a lady today who said that this has, it has pulled us back a generation because before this generation of voters who believe in this process again, it will take so many more years. I mean, it's, it's one of those situations where we wish that INEC had done the right thing at the right time. All eyes are on INEC right now, whether they want to admit it or not. Every observer mission has released a statement indicting INEC on this particular matter. And it's not just about the divas. Late training of collation officers. We had postponements of training. We had so many things that were not logistical problems that were going on. Places where the Vivas machine was not working. In fact, I went to Guarimpa, and when I was at Guarimpa uh, during the elections on Saturday, a particular polling unit, they, once they saw the TV crew, they started screaming, yes, yes, please come, please come. The Vivas machine is not working. And then we had to call, and you know, a lot of reports were made, and then they brought another Vivas machine. But that's one place. What about the other places? Mm. You know, so a lot of these logistical problems has actually put a, a big strain on yeah. the trust that the Nigerian person has for the electoral process. And that is a trust that Mahmoud Yakubu, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, we held him on to. So this is a crucial moment in Nigeria's history. And we don't know how this is going to play it's out. It's going to play out. I mean, Kayla, thank happens. you. Thank you very much for that, for those perspectives. And, 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 and I know you have to go back in and, and, and do a bit of work. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, but uh, Chukwa Meka, please stay with me. Ike, stay with me also. I want to get the perspective of the Ghanaian observers on the ground uh, to this. Based on everything else you've said, the ECOWAS sent a strong team of observers to Nigeria. One of them is our own Koko Engdoho, who is a member of the ECOWAS Observer Mission, joins us on phone right now. Also joining me is Peter Makmenu. He's a former chairman of the New Patriotic Party, the governing New Patriotic Party. He is on the ground in Nigeria with the Democratic Union of Africa. And I'll quickly bring him into the conversation now, but I want to get quickly to Koko Endoho. Koko, I, I saw, um, I'll bring Koko in, I, I, I believe I lost him. But Mr. McMenu, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us. You are on the ground, you've been in Ghanaian politics for so long, I, I, and I've been stressing the point about the like, implications uh, of the Nigerian outcome for the sub-region uh, generally and, and for Ghana. Why is it important? for Nigeria to get this right. Hello, Mr. McMahon, if you can kindly unmute for me on, on the Zoom, I'll be very grateful. Certainly, Nigeria has to get this right because as the most populous country in Africa and the ECOWAS region, the economic giant, their activities at all levels have multiplied effect on countries within the ECOWAS 
and Africa as a whole. So I keep saying that anything that happens to Nigeria has or will have cascading effect on ECOWAS countries. And the success of Nigeria is also good for the ECOWAS because they can pull us along just as Japan did for the Southeast Asia nations. So everybody in the sub region must be very concerned about the elections in Nigeria, an election with voter population of 93 million is no joke. I think that there has been so much full of value about IRL and beavers. But let me ask you, what is the translation or the meaning of IRL? IRL simply means INEC viewing results viewing portal. So you go there to view the results, to give more confidence and transparency to the elections. And INEC has touted that as one of the technological innovations in the 2023 elections. So for me, there shouldn't be any doubt about it. But I think that it is, it is better late than never. As we speak, I was able to log on to the portal and there are, there are now at about 75,000 polling units uploaded out of 176. So gradually it's picking up. It's picking up because how many uh, states have been officially certified and declared by INE? As we were coming from the coalition center this evening, it was about 10 or 12 or so. So if they have been able to upload up to 75,000 polo units, then it means something is being done. It's not like they have abandoned it in its entirety. So I think that by the close of, by the, by, by the time we wake up tomorrow morning, we will see more polo units uploaded on the portal for us to view. I read. That is my view. I see. I mean, Chuko, so that's uh, an observer's point there. That, I mean, it's, it's not such, it wasn't deliberate. It was a reminder. They've uploaded it and it's coming through trickling in. And they're holding all this very open, uh, you know, announcement of the results and allowing the uh, agents to challenge them publicly if they want it. And then they explain and then they move forward. I mean, isn't that transparent enough? Well, uh, uh, honestly speaking, um, um, Evans, let's look at the history of electoral violence in our sub-region. One of the major causes of electoral violence is the inability of the electorates or the political parties to predict our next processes. Electoral processes should be predictable. And where there is a major gap, the electoral management body should immediately address that gap. That did not happen. And what I'm saying, I have refused to make any reference to any iota of fraud being committed or attempted to be committed. My point is that at a point that leading up to the election day, there has been consistency in the words and in the actions of the Independent National Electoral Commission about the procedure and the processes of this election. If at any point in time you're going to miss any of those processes, it is important that you have already had a contingency plan through which you address that gap. That has not happened. I am saying that I'm convinced that most of the political parties may even have already have, uh, have hold of their results. But when you create this gap, you allow emotions. Elections are filled with emotions. People do not, in, especially in this part of our world where election also determines who gets what, when, and how, people do not easily accept defeat. So in order to address that inability of people to 
accept defeat, what you do is that you do not create room for them to take over the management of the election. The electorates, the political parties have taken over from INEC and they are now commanding INEC when to start, when to stop, when not to continue, and so on and so forth. And allowing different types of interpretation, both from international communities and from even elder statespersons like President, former President Obasanjo. So I see that as a huge gap within the INEC processes. And I'm saying that they did not come early enough to address the people about this gap. Finally, uh, Evans, let's also look at what implication that already have. The implication is this, that people are putting question mark on an election that ordinarily should have gone seamlessly. I haven't seen where people have, people have forgiven INEC for coming late to the election. That's normal. People have forgiven INEC for all manner of things that they have did, done, except this one. And what does that tell you? That people are now beginning to suspect that INEC is doing that because they need to cook results. And we shouldn't allow that at this age of our election. And I'm saying that from the National Assembly, in terms of funds, in terms of logistics, in terms of laws, that everything was given to INEC. They did not dispute any attempt of anybody to scuttle this election, either by not releasing funds, including when there was a cash crunch. They met with the CBN. CBN released funds. So INEC had everything it needed, apart from the communication gap that mm. now is taking everybody into some jeopardy that we are now trying to find a way to come out of. It shouldn't be that way for the so-called leading democracy in the region. It shouldn't be that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, give me your take on, on, on the concerns you've had, both from Chukwe Mecca and Kayla Elia. You, you've, been, you've been fundamentally been working with the results trying to you know, look at serial models. I, do you have share the concerns? Uh, yes, I do. And sort of my concerns also extend to you know, um, the fact that we don't do elections in a vacuum. Elections are supposed to be the crucible of democracy, right? And, and what has happened um, in, in the wider West African region is a gradual walk back from democracy um, with the coups that you've seen in you know, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Guinea, with the slow degrade and degradation, right, of democratic norms in a part of the world which in the 60s and 70s and 80s was known as the cool capital, right, um, you, know, you know, of the entire planet, um, the hard fought gains in getting all of our democracies from yours to ours to all of the other democracies, right, that returned back to the democratic rule in the 90s and in the early 2000s are waning. And it's largely because for a lot of West Africans, they're slowly making the association between democracy and, you know, a constriction of economic freedoms, you know, the relative lack of economic development right across the continent. And for many of them, say what you want to say about, you know, about the military, right? Some econ economic growth, right, was recorded um, within those periods. Almost everybody here on this panel is a creature of some form of, you know, military dictatorship or military rule right across West Africa. And the fundamental imperative, and this is why a lot of resources, a lot of institutional and, uh, and capital was invested right into INEC in order to conduct this exercise was that Nigeria was supposed to serve as that counter example, that counter example to all that we've been seeing in the Sahel and all that we've been observing right across West Africa over the last two to four years in showing that it is possible for an African democracy to wrestle with the difficult questions of trying to build and strengthen and deepen democratic norms and actually succeed and INEC has, you know, through this outcome, you know, I, I like to put it this way, INEC has operationally disenfranchised millions of Nigerians. That there's, there's just no other easy way to, um, to, to put it. And, and so really, when you, when you square what has happened over the weekend and sort of the trickle flow of results and where Nigeria goes from here through the rest of the week into next week, we've got another contest in the middle of March for 28th. Nigerian state, and you know, 
and, and, and looking on out, right, for the rest of the year, the signs aren't looking very good right right now. Okay. It, it's like Nigerians fundamentally have, you know, they're, they're suffering from institutional fatigue. The CBN has not been able to manage the currency change, right? The NNPC has not been able to manage what many says they are only real bread and butter from the Nigerian state. So, 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 clearly, so right? clearly, I see, I see there are real concerns there. And the next few days will be critical, as you've indicated. Ike, I want to quickly bring back in to the conversation um, uh, Peter McMinnu. Mr. McMinnu, I'm interested, because you are a, a leading figure locally uh, for the Governor New Patriotic Party and you're on, in, in Nigeria, We've been, we are watching Nigeria because we, we, everybody is trying to draw parallels between the Nigerian election outcomes and Ghana. We've seen the emergence, Peter McMinnu, of a strong third force in, 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 the, Labour, in the Labour Party and, and Peter Obi. You on the ground seeing that play out when we, many people thought that duopoly will never be broken. And looking at it from a Ghanaian perspective, I wonder what your reaction has been to that and whether you think that is even remotely possible in Ghana. Thank you very much, Ivans. I think that scenario is a bit different from Ghana in the sense that political party management and organization and attachment of party members to their party in terms of values and ideology are different in Ghana from Nigeria. If you take somebody like Pitobi, he was an APGA governor. Then later he became uh, a PDP governor and PDP vice presidential candidate and then switched to Labour Party. So the man has traveled through about three or four political parties before becoming the presidential candidate of the Labour Party. Me and you know that that cannot happen in Ghana because we are attached to our values and ideologies and history of the political parties that we embrace. So, so the Ghanaian electorate, a third party may emerge, but not somebody uh, who has traveled to different, different political parties and emerging ultimately as a leader or a candidate of a party. I do not think me and you would accept that in Ghana. We would then, we would want perhaps a new party, a new face, a new altogether. We are not somebody who has traveled along the same beach from governorship of APGA to governorship of PDP to presidential candidate of, of Labour Party. Uh, Ghanaians will not accept that. So along those lines, the party organization and ideology and membership drives in Ghana is different from that of Nigeria. They abandon their party anyhow, anytime. But that is barely done in Ghana. We are committed to our party. We stick to it, whether in opposition or in government. But in other jurisdictions like Nigeria and Kenya, they defect and go and back and forth. And I think that is not healthy for multi-party democracy. Mm, but, but that's very interesting thoughts there. And I'll get Chuku's reaction to that because I see he has something to say on this. But thankfully, we lost Koko Aindoho on the line and he's joined us now, I believe. And so I'm going to go to him because very quickly, I know Koku works with the ECOWAS. Um, observer mission, and there's a lot of concern that we've had already on, on the concerns on the ground. Uh, and he they, they, they issued a lengthy statement on this. Ms. Andrew, thank you for your time, and, and apologies that we lost you earlier. But if you can confirm for me what the ECOWAS observed as the challenges with the process, uh, as particularly with the, with the transparency and others that we've heard a lot about on this show in the last hour. Well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Evans and uh... Good evening to my senior brother, uh, Mr. Peter Bakmenu, and your colleague on the other side. Well, there's a preliminary statement that has been issued by uh, the chairman of the ECOWAS uh, mission, and that is uh, uh, His Excellency uh, President N.S. by Koroma. And it's, it's quite explicit in terms of what ECOWAS 
uh, was mandated to do and the observations that ECOWAS has made. Uh, ECOWAS has not run away from the fact that uh, issues uh, back to the electoral uh, process, uh, specifically the late beginning of polls or uh, polling stations, and um, other glitches and hitches uh, here and there. And so uh, the, statement, the statement has not run away from, 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 from the issues. But then again, also, it is quite clear that uh, the elections took place in uh, many places, and um, the processes went quite well. And as, as, as I said earlier, this is just a preliminary uh, statement from ECOWAS. I'm sure in good time, um, we all respect the fact that the Independent National Electoral Commission of Nigeria ultimately uh, shall declare the results as and when they are. Uh, gather what it is that is gathered. And um, okay. when that happens, I'm sure it was will speak to uh, the issues uh, there. The um, collation process is concerned. Did ECOWAS observe anything that is worth highlighting at this point? Oh, well, um, the, 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 the statement is quite, quite, quite clear. I mean, um, issues pertaining to uh, the non-functioning of the Uber machine in certain areas, uh, violence, leading uh, incidences here and there. And so ECOWAS has not run away from those, those, those issues. So, uh, like I said, this is just a preliminary statement from ECOWAS. There's no intention to go into the details whether somebody's right or somebody's wrong. And I'm sure when that happens, uh, ECOWAS will speak uh, appropriately. Mm. Ms. Endo, thank you very much. Uh, with the ECOWAS thank Observer uh, mission there uh, also. I want to quickly return to the point that uh, Peter McMinu had made in drawing parallels between the Nigerian elections and us and the emergence of this third force, this uh, Peter Obi phenomenon. Um, Chukwu and Mika Eze, you thankfully have had the best of both worlds, Nigeria and Ghana. Do you agree with the assessment by uh, Peter McMenu that the dynamics of the Nigerian politics is very different from, from what we experience in Ghana? And so it's very unlikely that we may have a character like Peter Obi emerge and lead a third four charge against the two main political parties, such as you have in Nigeria? I think where I agree with him is that uh, uh, having been part of the Ghanaian politics for, and democracy for a while, I would say yes, I agree with him fully that the attachment of um, Ghanaian politicians to their political parties is huge. You know, I'll, I'll concede to that. But the environment that necessitated the emergence of a P2B exists in Ghana. So it, it, people are getting almost disenchanted with the system. And therefore, I do not preclude the fact that there is a possibility of a thought force emerging in Ghana. That may be somebody out of age, out of uh, non-conformist from the system, from nowhere, probably somebody, but it is very likely, and we shouldn't jettison that, you know. So, a P2B, yes, have traveled around all the political parties and may have lacked that moral um, uh, 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 obligation to even establish a thought force, but he represented something. Number one is that he represented almost a zero dent in terms of, uh, in terms of corruption. Number two is that he represented the hopes and aspirations of the answers which is almost like the youth mm. the, of, of the country. And I see that happening in Ghana. People have tested the NDC, people have tested the NPP, and people are looking for alternative. Not necessarily because the alternative will become a messiah, but we are just fatigued. There is also fatigue that may necessitate the emergence of a third force. 
Where that thought force will come from, whether it is going to come from NDC or NPP, I agree with Honorable McMahon that that may not be possible, but probably somebody from somewhere will just emerge. And they will take the courage from what has happened in Nigeria. If this P2B does not win this election, he has made a statement. And that statement is going to be loud and even louder, even post this election. Ike. Um, I, I, I completely agree with uh, Chukwemeka. I suppose, so, so um, let me give you a very vivid illustration um, of, um, of sort of how the Nigerian experience could easily translate and, and inspire Ghana. When Emmanuel Macron emerged as, uh, as France's president in 2017, we had a very far-reaching conversation here in Nigeria as to whether a political outsider, relatively speaking, who has some political experience and has been part of government, can cobble together an unlikely political coalition and then win um, you know, the presidency of a major country. And the, the dominant consensus at the time was that, oh, it was impossible in Nigeria. Now, Peter Obito Claire has not won the contest, of course, but he's certainly taken that motif that you saw, uh, you know, Emmanuel Macron used to ride, um, you, know, you know, on his coattails to the Elysee Palace, and he's certainly on his way. There's certainly a path that still exists where Peter Obi does end up in Aso Rock. And I think what that really um, should tell you know, um, you know, members of the Nigerian political elite, as well as members of the European um, really, um, elite, is that they have been served notice, right? You know, young burgeoning populations bursting with innovation, bursting with energy. You know, lots of demographers and researchers talk about this demographic, you know, ticking bomb or this demographic dividend that Africa is currently sitting on. They will make demands. And they will look for people that speak best to them as a constituency in a language that they understand and are committed to delivering outcomes that are favorable to their interests. And so the politics of old, the politics, you know, of business as usual, really now as we're, you know, stepping into the 21st century or at least knee deep into the 21st century as we are right now, it's just not going to cut it. Mm. And it's either going to happen through democratic change or democratic means, or as we've seen in some African countries, it's going to happen violently through, yeah. you know, aggressive, you know, government and, takeover. And, and, and I want to go back to Peter McMenu very briefly. Mr. McMenu, do, do you at least concede that the conditions, and Chukwemeka makes the point, the conditions that gave rise to the Peter Obi phenomenon are very ripe in Ghana as well? And that it's could right, be the trigger. It's right globally. It's right globally because the world economy is not in the best of shapes. This is a global phenomenon. So if you ask me, I will say globally, governments are suffering from global fallout in, uh, 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 in our economies. Disruptions in supply chain and its effects on domestic economies. That's a global phenomenon. You have it in Nigeria, you have it in Ghana, you have it in Ivory Coast, you have it in uh, Kenya, and all over. Kenya has it. So, so I will agree with you on that score. But I'm saying, much as I commend Peter, U, Peter Ubi for winning Lagos, for example, where he's coming from and his background, it's not suitable to Ghanaian politics. But, but, but somebody, but yet you're right, but somebody can completely, beyond those two parties in Ghana, also emerge as a third force. Well, he may try. That's why we need in a, in a multi party democracy. Nobody is prevented from forming a party. We've got, we've seen it several times. We've seen Pap Kosti Indu when he came up from. So this is not. Uh, what Obi is doing is not, uh, it hasn't happened. It has happened in Ghana before, you know. Yeah, except happened. that Indum, Indum did not have the obedience and the coconut head generation uh, to support him. I mean, that, that, was, that was a different. He didn't have the coconut head generation backing him. Freedom, Ghana is a democratic country. We have freedom of speech. I think three weeks or so, 
there was a new political party formed and which was approved by by electoral commission. Yeah. So people can form political parties and 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 canvass for votes. Mm. No, nothing if they meet the legal requirements. Okay. Labour Party existed before Okobi joined to become the leader. Yeah. So it's not Labour Party had won a state. I think it's Okun governorship before. So Labour Party oh, sure. itself is is a party that had uh, uh, roots. Okay, it wasn't a new party. So so you must look at the dynamics of it. They differ from Ghana to Nigeria. Mm. I mean, so so that's one of the key parallels that many are looking at, and and Nigerians are, um, yeah, yes. There is freedom of speech in Ghana. There is freedom to form political parties. There is no ban on political activity. Anybody can form or join any other political party. There are other uh, uh, parties who somebody in the in the in the stature of Obi can also go in and command. And lead like like Obi has led the the the, the Labour Party to a bigger height. Mm. And and, yeah. and, so and that freedom is there. And and so and quickly. And, and quickly, Ike. Um, I need to wrap up, but quickly, Ike. I know your team at SBM Intelligence have been watching the numbers and doing an analysis. What what is the realistic possibility that Obi might win the elections? Um, so to be very fair, his path right now looks um, uh, uh, quite elongated. Um, we've got we've gotten um, uh, I'm just looking at we've gotten 16 state races that have been announced so far, either by INEC centrally or by the various state uh, resident electoral commissions. Uh, you know, the APC has won seven, the PDP has won six, Labour has won three, which is already better than what any other third party force. Uh, has done in you know in post 1999 you know Nigerian electoral history, and on the crucial 25 percent vote share, he's currently underperforming, right? So, okay. and he's just gotten 25 percent or more of the vote in four states. He had to win in three of those states, right, in order to raise that bar. And I think the only other states where he got to that number without winning, I'm just trying to double check my math, I believe is, um, okay, it, it doesn't immediately jump properly. But the fact of the matter remains that it's a little part, right? He has to get a majority. And yes, there are lots of states in the South, South and in the South East, and as well as, as well as the North Central geopolitical zones, where we expect a lot of his votes to come from, having yet reported, and they almost likely report numbers tomorrow. But for now, his path is elongated. It's, it's not completely so it, obliterated, but it's certainly more difficult. Okay, right so now. it looks more difficult for him to win. But, um, and, and, and Chukwemeka, you make the point that, yes, he may not win, but if he doesn't win, what would that do to Nigeria's democracy going into the next elections? You think that the OB factor, the OB phenomenon, is a start of a revolution? I think it would depend on, on his enthusiasm because um, he's also a factor within the Labour Party. Labour Party is not just Labour Party. Labour Party has become a force because of uh, obese factor. Uh, you know, so I think I would urge him to stay in opposition. Um, luckily, he's winning a lot of uh, membership of the um, Senate, winning House of Rep. He's going to win a couple of governorship elections, which has never happened for a party that almost came on stream, as it were, back to life just eight months ago. That's phenomenal already. But I think that what is important is that whether it is in Nigeria or in Ghana, even what Honorable McMenu is saying, it may not even be a political party per se. It could be a group of force within any of the two major political parties in Ghana that will simply say, enough is enough. We want something new. And it could just be the third force, even though within a political party. And that's possible. And they will just upset any presidential uh, candidate of the old, as it were, and then you start the movement. But what I think is important is that whatever is the outcome of this election, Pitobi should take 
courage and remain resolute and also remain with his supporters to build the Labour Party of his dream. Thank you very much, Cheku Emeka Ezi. Thank you very much, uh, Peter McMenu. I will wait for you to return and I will sit down with you proper for a proper conversation uh, <laughs> on, this, on this matter. Uh, trust me, I'll reach out to you when you return because we need to explore this into detail. I'm grateful that you joined us. Uh, you also had. I'm, uh, I'm not scared him. I'm not scared of Honorable McMenu. No, he's not scared. <laughs> oh, Honorable McMenu, I can promise you, uh, very little scares him. He's been in this game for so long. I'm grateful uh, for you both. I also, Kayla, joined us earlier. Koko Aindu, who as well. All of you. Enjoy the rest of your uh, evening, people.